Psychology has not only taken over secular society, and remember, all of this has happened within the last few decades. In fact, it has only really exploded since World War II. But psychology has also taken over the church. And when you talk about Christian psychology, people are under the mistaken idea that there is a cohesive body of knowledge known as Christian psychology. And they think there's a big difference between Christian psychology and secular psychology. It might surprise you to know that there isn't really any difference. And that Christian psychology does not exist. It's in fact a myth. We want to deal with that in this session. Let's open our Bibles to a couple of scriptures. Second Timothy chapter 3, well-known scripture, I'm sure, verses 16 and 17. You could all quote it, most of you at least, I hope. It says, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's all scripture. Is profitable for doctrine. And Paul warns us in the next chapter that the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. I think we're in that day. People want to go by feelings. They want to go by images, by visualization. They want to go by everything except truth. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. We need reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. We desperately need that in the church today. We need some correction on television, in books. The Christian media is leading many astray. But notice this verse, that the man, and that includes women, that the man of God may be perfect, that means mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You would get the idea from this scripture that the Bible gives us what we need. If you turn to Second Peter chapter 1, again, scriptures that we all should know by heart. <clears throat> chapter 2, I'm sorry. Verse 1, there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Unfortunately, that's happening. It's one of the marks of the last days. But if you go back to verse uh, chapter 1, Notice verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us some of what we need for life and godliness. Now it doesn't say that. It says all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. You know these verses, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, we could give you many other verses. We are branches in the true vine. Christ has become our life. We have the mind of Christ. Uh, we don't need anything else as far as spiritual life, and, and blessing and fulfillment is concerned. Now you understand the Bible does not claim to be a medical handbook. It doesn't uh, claim to be a physics textbook. Uh, it doesn't claim to give you advice for the IRS or anything like that, <clears throat> although it does amazingly give a lot of advice in all of these areas. But the Bible does claim to be God's spiritual handbook for man's spiritual life and welfare. Now, you could fly in an airplane with a, a Buddhist or a Hindu pilot, and you wouldn't even know what his religious beliefs were. You could consult a medical doctor, and um, uh, regardless of his religious beliefs, he could help you physically. 
But don't consult a, a, a priest of another religion for spiritual needs. You understand what I'm trying to say? And so we're going to be talking about psychology and inner healing today. Psychology claims to be the study of the, in Greek, the tsuke, the psyche, the soul. And psychologists talk about the soul and the spirit and the spiritual side of man. Well, what right do they have, godless humanists, to tell us about spiritual truths? That's the problem. The Bible, when it comes to spiritual truths, claims to have all of the answers. And no help is needed from anyone else. Now, while we're talking about that, we might just deal with this thing called faith. Because very often, skeptics criticize Christians, and they think of faith as some kind of a leap in the dark, you know. You just decide to believe something. That is not biblical faith. For biblical faith, you ought to have some healthy skepticism. That's one of the problems with Christians. Christians are very, very gullible. And they will get involved in almost anything. And I'm astonished at what Christians will get involved in. But the reason that you need faith is because God knows things that you don't know. And he can do things that you can't do, and he can't even explain it to you. And if you're going to say, God, until you explain it to my peanut brain, I'm not going to believe it. You know, uh, that's what the atheist says. Well, if I can't touch it, if I can't understand, I can't feel it, and so forth, why don't you say that to a medical doctor? When he diagnoses your problem, you say, well, doc, I'm not going to believe you until I've taken four years of medical college and a couple of years of internship and a couple of years of specialization. Well, you're dead by then. Uh, see, even a person, a skeptic, who laughs at Christians for having faith, they all exercise a form of faith. Now, it's not real faith because faith is in God. God, faith is total, absolute, unquestioning trust. And only God deserves that. Nothing else and no one else deserves that. But we all exercise a form of faith. You <clears throat> go to the druggist, I hope not very often, <clears throat> <clears throat> and he has um, gotten a prescription written in a hand that you can't even read from a medical doctor who knows things that you don't know and the pharmacist puts things together that you don't understand and you rely upon a man and, and not only drug us but in many other ways you rely upon people you cannot receive the benefits of modern society modern civilization without relying, trusting people who know what you don't know and who can do what you can't do, and they do it for you, right? Well, then how much more ought we to trust God, who certainly knows what we don't know? But now you, I hope you don't go to a druggist who has a bad reputation. People have been dying because uh, of some of the drugs that he's mixed incompetently, or a physician who loses half of his patients on the operating table. You wouldn't go to somebody like that, and you shouldn't trust God unless you really know him. And that's why we need to get to know him. And that's where faith comes from. It's not a power of the mind. But faith grows out of a relationship with God. And you begin to trust him. You get to know him. And you begin to know his will. And he begins to guide you. And you become the instrument of his will. And he begins to mold you to his will. This is faith. Faith is not some power of the mind. You just decide, well, I'm going to believe. And if I believe it, that will make it so. Faith depends upon facts. It depends upon reality. And God begins to reveal things to us. And we've been trying to show that the whole thing that we're talking about is turning people from truth to the lie, from real faith to a positive mental attitude or something else that is a substitute, turning them from God to some other power, and ultimately to themselves where the answer lies within and we become God and we play God and we begin to control <clears throat> our destiny everything that we're talking about could be put in that nutshell from the cults to the old cult to the new age movement to the things that are coming inside the church of Jesus Christ now we also mentioned and we're just summarizing some basic concepts we also mentioned that you can't mix science and religion you can't mix science and Christianity you can't mix uh, science and faith. 
And you can't mix science and mind. Uh, people talk about uh, mental illness. There is no such thing as a mental illness. Thomas Sass, one of the uh, best-known psychiatrists today, written a number of books. One of his books is, he's a non-practicing Jew, by the way. And by the way, this non-practicing Jew, Thomas Sass, says, you Christians ought to take this back into the church. It doesn't belong out here. We've got nothing to offer these people. And he's a psychiatrist. And Thomas Sass says, uh, we have taken the salvation of sinful souls and we've turned it into the cure of sick minds. Okay? And one of his books is titled, The Myth of Mental Illness. Why is mental illness a myth? Well, you can have a sick brain, you can have a, a chemical imbalance or a nutritional deficiency or somebody hits you in the head and you've got, a, you know, damage to the brain. But how do you have a sick mind? A mind is not physical. Sickness is physical. That's something for a medical doctor to deal with. But we're talking about which doctors who are dealing with spiritual problems. You don't have a mental illness. It's a moral or a spiritual problem. And we have taken it, a moral and spiritual problem, and we have turned it into a mental illness. Well, an illness. I mean, don't blame me for having contracted, you know, what is it, diphtheria or, or a, 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 a flu or whatever. Uh, that's not a moral problem. Now, some illnesses, you can get into them through moral problems. But most of them, we're talking about a bacteria got a hold of you. So you see, immediately, as soon as we call it a mental illness, I am no longer responsible for this. You ought to pity me. I'm sick. It's not a decision that I made, but it's something that I fell into. It, it got a hold of me. I talk to people, for example, try to counsel with some people who are depressed. And so long as they think that depression is a sickness and it's an unusual problem that has come upon me <clears throat> you know it's because of my upbringing my childhood or whatever it might be it's not my fault then you can't deal with this morally and spiritually and they're not willing to come to the word of god and take the solution that god offers but the bible offers a solution for everything that psychology claims to offer for example <clears throat> The scripture says, be anxious for nothing. Are you anxious? Are you nervous? Are you concerned? You don't have to go through weeks of psychotherapy. You don't have to go through months of counseling. It simply says, be anxious for nothing, but with everything. In prayer, with prayer and thanksgiving. In everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding... No psychiatrist has understood this. Nobody has understood what God will do for you if you will trust Him. That's the difference between the biblical solution and the psychological solution. Now, <clears throat> we said you can't mix science and religion and science and Christianity, and unfortunately that's one of the things that we try to do because we live in a scientific age and we have come to worship science. Science. Says. Well, if science says, then it must be true. But scientists, you know, I happen to be a certified public accountant. I can remember as a boy, I knew some certified public accountants, and I thought they were practically gods, you know. I mean, they never made a mistake. Well, I found out that certified public accountants are just boys that grew up and became certified public accountants. And they can still make mistakes. And it's the same is true of scientists. They're just boys or, or girls who grew up and became scientists, you know? They're human beings. <clears throat> they have the same kind of problems that everybody else has, and they also have a bias. And many of them are not willing to accept the God of creation, and their science is an attempt to find a rationale for putting him out of his universe and explaining the universe without God. In fact, when I grew up as a boy, they thought that science would do that. Science was one day going to be able to explain everything. If science could explain everything, including love, for example, then for me to say to my wife, I love you, 
would be no more significant than to say, I have a gastrointestinal pain or I have an itch. Because love itself would have to be a natural process explicable scientifically, and it would be meaningless, right? <clears throat> so you see what you do when you try to make it scientific, you destroy the man that God has made who has a free will. It's like B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist in Walden II, a book that he wrote to get some of his ideas across, he has his alter ego, Fraser, says to his guest, we're trying to develop a science of human behavior. And then rather ruefully he says, <clears throat> but you can't have a science when the subject of your experiment is hopping about capriciously with a free will and you don't know what he's going to do next. You cannot make a science out of human behavior. But we live in a scientific age when we want to explain everything scientifically. And so we're going to... And psychology is an attempt to scientifically explain human behavior. It is an attempt to explain the mind. It is a science of mind. It's a secular science of mind, but it is a religion. It is a rival religion to Christianity, and you cannot put, make a marriage between the two. Psychology, uh, science itself is an attempt to explain the universe without God. And so, the skeptic says to you, well, you believe in God simply because science hasn't yet explained everything. <clears throat> but one day, science will have explained everything. You see, like the ignorant uh, Greeks and Romans back there, when lightning struck, they thought the gods were throwing thunderbolts. Well, now we've explained that away, and we've, we've shoved God out of that area of the universe. And bit by bit, science is replacing God with, a, with its laws and its explanations. And finally, we don't, there'll be no need for God anymore when we've got it all explained. And that's where it's heading. That's the aim. Then it astonishes me that Christians would try to bring science into the church. And they would try to <clears throat> bolster their faith with scientific explanations. So science is an attempt to investigate the universe. And it ends up denying God and worshiping the cosmos, in the, the creation instead of the creator. And psychology ends up worshiping self. It examines man, looks into the depths of his psyche, instead of getting to know God and turning from self, and it ends up with the worship of self. <clears throat> psychology is all about man. It has nothing to do with God. The saints of old used to cry, Oh, that I might know Him. Oh, that I might love Him more. But today the saints in the church of Jesus Christ cry, Oh, that I might know myself and love myself better and esteem myself more highly. This is not traditional Christianity, and it certainly is not biblical Christianity. And there is an attempt to change our behavior based upon scientific ideas rather than upon submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and coming to His cross. It's a denial that the Bible has the answers that it claims to have. Well, what is psychology and how did this thing get started and where are its roots? December, I think it was early in December 1985, they had the largest conference in the history of psychology. About 7,000 psychologists and psychiatrists met in Phoenix, Arizona, and they had to turn about 3,000 away. It was the last time that the great masters would all be together. Uh, Maslow and Rogers and Ellis and, and Saz and, and some of these people. They met to discuss where psychology had come from and where it was going. And you know what? They could not agree on either. Richard Volpe, one of the great masters who was there, looking at the confusion in this uh, conference, said, Who would have imagined that the evolution of psychology would come to this? I'm quoting him verbatim. 
a Babel of conflicting voices, quote unquote. Babel revived is what it is. R. D. Lane. See, very often Christian psychologists they get upset at me, and if there are people who you know, there are several segments out there in the church that are very upset with the seduction of Christianity. Uh, the positive confession people, uh, for sure, but Christian psychologists also. And they say, you don't have any training in psychology. Well, I've studied it a great deal. I don't claim to be an expert on psychology or an expert on anything else. And I've been studying the Bible for 40-some years on my knees, and I don't claim to be an expert on the Bible. But I think I know enough about psychology. But don't listen to Dave Hunt. Let's listen to some of them. And R.D. Lang, one of the great uh, masters today, said, and listen to this carefully. He says, I cannot think of one thing that psychology has offered the human race in the area of interpersonal relationships that is of any benefit in its entire hundred years since Freud. How about that? I can quote you psychologists and psychiatrists, one after the other. This is the biggest ripoff ever foisted upon the human race. Michael Scriven, uh, Michael Scriven, formerly of the Ethics Committee of the American Psychological Association, says, quote, Bas based upon the results it produces, if psychotherapy were a drug, the FDA would ban it. E. Fuller Torrey, one of the top research psychiatrists in the world, says, and I'm quoting him again, with few exceptions, the methods of Western psychiatrists are on the same scientific level as the methods of witch doctors. We had a recent test where they matched Western psychiatrists against witch doctors. It came out a dead heat. The only difference was the witch doctors charged less and released their patients sooner. And, I, and I'm telling you the truth. Jay Ziskin, psychologist with California State University System, says, quote, A psychiatric diagnosis is more likely to be wrong than right, unquote. How about that? And at this great conference, you see, you've believed a lie. These are the experts. These are the professionals. They can't solve their own problems, and they've got nothing to offer, and they admit it. And at that great conference in, in Phoenix, R.D. Lang said, during my current bout with depression, okay, so if you've got depression, don't go to R.D. Lang. He can't solve this problem. Go to the Word of God. Go to Jesus Christ himself. But he said, during my current bout with depression, I have discovered something more beneficial than anything psychotherapy has to offer. Wow, what is this? He says, you hum a favorite tune. You want to know what my tune is, he says? Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end of the road. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, the end thereof are the ways of death. We shouldn't laugh, we should weep for the millions of people who are being led astray by these gurus, these witch doctors with PhDs and MD degrees. It's a sham. And they are foisting it upon a gullible public. And Martin L. Gross, in his book, the, the, the Psychological Society, he's an investigative reporter, he refers to the public, the, he says, grateful guinea pigs. To show the confusion at this conference, they had a panel of the four leading experts on schizophrenia. And three of them said it doesn't exist. And R.D. Lang said it didn't exist until somebody invented the word. They can't make a diagnosis of this. You might read the book Inside the Criminal Mind by Dr. Samno, a clinical psychologist who worked with a psychiatrist for years on criminals. And they came to the conclusion they had to throw out everything that they had ever learned from psychology. They came to the conclusion that criminals are criminals, not because they were raised in a ghetto, not because their parents beat them, not because they were deprived or they missed out or they were mistreated or abused. 
sexually or in any other way, but they were criminals for one reason, they had decided to act that way. And that all of the rehabilitation money, all of the psychotherapy was wasted until they admitted that they had made a choice. And for a good reason, they decided not to be. And they decided to change and they asked for help to change. We've been ripped off by another explanation for sin. Thomas Sass says, you've turned the cure of sinful souls into the cure of sick minds. And that's what psychotherapy is basically all about. And at that great conference, Carl Rogers received a standing ovation from this large audience before he had even uttered a word. This is Carl Rogers. His influence within the Church of Jesus Christ is horrendous as well as throughout our society. Carl Rogers, who had recently communicated with the spirit of his dead wife through a Ouija board. They had had a long, happy marriage, but in her uh, the last few years of her life, she was very ill. She required a lot of help. Carl Rogers decided, you've got to be true to yourself. We'll talk about selfism, God willing, in the next, uh, our next session. Well, I can't be true to myself if I spend all of my time taking care of her. So they had had an alienation and he had developed another relationship coincident with her death. He had guilt because of this, because psychotherapy is not going to explain it away, although they may try. And what do you know? He made contact with Helen through a Ouija board. And Helen said, enjoy, Carl. Enjoy. Be free. And he wipes his hand across his brow and says, By gosh, what a wave of relief swept over me. <laughs> Isn't that tremendous? He receives a standing ovation before he says a word. And his theories are rampant within the church of Jesus Christ. Where does it come from? It comes out of the occult. All right? Now, Sigmund Freud, two people, Freud and Jung. Freud did not believe in the occult, as a matter of fact. Well, then how can I say that his theory comes out of the occult? Well, because he discovered his major, uh, his major uh, theories. Well, they were at that Phoenix conference. They said they were educated guesses at best and were not scientific. That's one of the things they agreed upon. It's not scientific. But they were discovered when he hypnotized patients and regressed them back into their childhood. They came out with alleged traumas that they had suffered in their childhood that had made them what they were. Martin Gross, in his book, The Psychological Society, and he's not a Christian by any means, I can tell you. He's just an investigative reporter out there examining the facts. He says, if science and statistics are not on the side of psychotherapy, and if shamanism and witch doctrine do as well, what is holding up its inordinate prestige? As in other major unscientific movements, its true support is a religious idea which has captured the mass imagination. What is that religious idea? One of the most powerful religious ideas of the second half of the 20th century is the great unconscious. We can control our present and our future, we're told, only if we learn the mysteries of psychology and psychiatry which can unlock the unconscious, like the primitive witch doctor the modern therapist promises to do this. Freud came up with the myth, two Freudian myths. The myth of the unconscious mind. Now remember, the unconscious mind is not that you've forgotten something and you're struggling and finally you'll remember it. No, the unconscious mind is something else over here. It's a receptacle of all of the things that have ever happened to you and you cannot... Uh, uh, what do we call it? Retrieve it? You, a computer term. You cannot access that through normal uh, thought processes, through memory and so forth, but only through a psychotherapeutic process. And there are about 10,000 of them out there attempting to do this. So you are everything that you have ever done. Let me read it from, uh, right from a self-improvement um, brochure here. Discoveries through inner quest. And they've got all kinds of self-improvement tapes and so forth. A little known fact in large letters. It is not a fact. 
It is a theory. Believe it or not, all the events of your life are being controlled by a powerful, compelling force. What is this force? It is your inner or subconscious mind, which, like a computer, has been programmed from the time of your birth to direct your life. Your subconscious mind, working day and night without your being consciously aware of it, houses all your memories, experiences, emotions, attitudes, beliefs, and habits. Whatever is impressed strongly in your subconscious mind forms the conditions and experiences of your life. So you see what you are. You are the product of all your past experiences. But Freud said, only from about up to year six, the unconscious mind is the receptacle of all this. Psychic determinism says that you are going to act out in your life the results of these traumas. And you are driven by unconscious urges and forces that make you do things that you don't even know why you're doing it. So, of course, you're not responsible for this. It's not my fault, but it was because my, my mother didn't change my diaper soon enough, uh, or, or they mistreated me or something in my childhood, and that programmed something into me that I don't even remember, but unconsciously, or we had a difficult birth, uh, you know, you go back into rebirthing and so forth and relive these things and straighten it out. Two myths. And here you are, just like Pavlov's dog, you know, just doing things because you've been programmed to do this by your past experiences. Well, it's a real problem if you can't remember these experiences. And there are millions of these experiences. You are on an endless quest, no matter how many. And this is where inner healing comes in. Inner healing is the layman's psychotherapy brought into the Church of Jesus Christ. To go into the past, and now we'll bring Jesus along, visualize Jesus coming along, and we'll have him heal these traumas from the past. And sometimes people seem to have a change, but then they sink into depression again, maybe worse. Well, then there must be another key event in my past that we haven't yet uncovered and dealt with. You've got an endless search for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I've got to keep going back into the past, back into the past. All right. Now, Freud got this out of hypnosis, although he didn't believe in, in psychic or religious or spiritual experiences. Nevertheless, psychic determinism and the unconscious mind are simply a watered-down, westernized version of karma and reincarnation. Freud's theory that it was your prior years of your life, your childhood years that made you what you are, is simply another version of prior lives made you what you are. And indeed, we have many serious psychiatrists and psychologists who are regressing people not only into the childhood, as Freud did, but on through the womb into prior lives. And you find out the reason that you have a hang-up about water is because in the 16th century you were a pirate and they made you walk the plank. And you've been afraid of water ever since in all your succeeding lives, you see. And these are serious psychiatrists who really believe this. Now, understand, they believe it, but they don't believe it. And we'll get into that in a moment when we get to Carl Jung. Well, we better, let's get to Carl Jung. Carl Jung was the heir apparent of Freud's throne. He was uh, a Protestant, and Freud was Jewish, and this was going to expand the acceptability of Freud's theories. The first time they met in 1909, they had an argument about this because Carl Jung said psychology is a study of the suke, the psyche, the, the soul. And he said, we don't know what the soul is, but he believed in religious experiences. This is why Christians, um, they find Carl Jung much uh, more acceptable uh, and base their theories more on him than upon Freud, although there's a mixture there that you can't undo. Freud's unconscious is the reservoir of evil mostly sexual evil because Freud was a sexual mess in fact he was a basket case he was a cocaine addict he, he had an obsessive fear of death although he was a medical doctor he couldn't look at a corpse he couldn't go to a funeral he was a mess but he has solved all of our problems for us you see and what he's done is projected his problems upon us all right but he did not he had the medical model Freud was a medical doctor, so everything is, is purely physical, glands and nerves and so forth. That's the way it began. But it has moved into the spiritual because the medical model obviously doesn't work. Now, Carl Jung was raised in a home, believe it or not, where the demonic activity was so intense that his mother kept a daily journal 
of the, of the poltergeist activity. She grew up in a similar home where her father, who was a Protestant minister in Switzerland, also a master mason, also involved in seances and so forth. Uh, Carl Jung's first thesis was about seances. He was involved in himself. The spirit activity was so intense in that home, she had to hold the spirits that day long enough for her father to write out his Sunday morning sermons. Carl Jung used to look as a boy at the, fo at the uh, a painting, a portrait of his grandfather, and stare at it until his grandfather walked right out of the frame and they walked arm in arm off into the woods to have their spiritual experiences together. He was a heavily demonized occultist. And the first time they met, that was a little problem between Freud and Jung because Freud didn't believe in this. And Carl Jung said, well, I'll show it to you. They were standing by a bookcase. He said, you're going to hear a loud shot come right out of this thing. And <laughs> Freud faints dead away, scared him to death. Well, the second time they met, even worse things happened, and Freud fainted dead away again. And when he came to this time, he accused Carl Jung of harboring a death wish against him. Because, remember, he had an obsessive fear of death. Carl Jung came to believe that that might be true unconsciously when in a dream he killed the Wagnerian hero Siegfried, which he interpreted to be Siegfried. Okay? And for the next six years he teetered on the brink of what Carl Jung himself called a total psychotic breakdown. He teetered on the brink of insanity and communication with demonic entities. Even the Holy Spirit came to him in the form of a dove. He talked to the saints of old and so forth, but in the process, he picked up a spirit guide named Philemon. And it was Philemon, the spirit guide, who taught Carl Jung exactly what the masters of the Temple of Wisdom taught Napoleon Hill, exactly what they've taught all kinds of other people, that the secret is in your imagination and visualization. And Carl Jung expanded Freud's unconscious to the collective unconscious which now became the reservoir of power of the entire human race, even going back to an embryo. And you can peel off layers of consciousness, get back to the consciousness of, I'm sorry, of an amoeba. Not just an embryo, but back to when you were an ape back there, or when you were, uh, you know, you crawled out of the sea and became an amphibian. Uh, all of that is in the collective unconscious. All of this great wisdom of all of our ancestors, and therefore, since everybody else is part of this collective unconscious, you can communicate with the dead. You can communicate, uh, well, a union analyst who is not a, he's not a charismatic, he's not a Christian by any means. Uh, when he's involved with a client in depth uh, therapy, it's called, even a non-Christian a uh, union analyst will get a visualization. He will get a word of knowledge. He will get an image that will tell him what your problem was. And then he tells you how to solve this. And he was taught about archetypal images that exist in the collective unconscious. And for example, if you're going to integrate these, uh, let's say you had some problems in your childhood, you would visualize your child archetype, which would be you as a child, and then you would visualize your hero archetype coming alongside, and if you were a Christian, of course, your hero archetype would be Jesus. Any, any Jungian analyst would do that. He doesn't have to be a Christian. Do I need to say more? <laughs> Where inner healing comes from and visualizing Jesus and Agnes Sanford got it from, from there. Uh, of course, if you're a Catholic, your hero archetype could be Mary. Now, Christian uh, inner healers, such as John and Paula Sanford and Dennis and Rita Bennett, for example, you ask them, why do you visualize Jesus back there in the past? Well, he's omnipresent, he's timeless, he exists outside the bounds of time, he was there. He's not there keeping you and guarding you until you become one of his sheep. Uh, there may be angels watching over those who will become heirs of salvation, but there's a time when Jesus, you belong to him. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you from that time on. 
But you can't go back there when you were not a Christian and visualize and say that Jesus was there. But how is it that the Catholics, uh, Francis McNutt, for example, or the Lynn brothers, they get just as good results visualizing Mary? Is Mary Lord of time? Is she timeless? Is she omnipresent? Does she exist outside the bounds of space and time? I don't think so. But American Indian shamans, they get terrific results visualizing coyotes. And uh, as one analyst of Carl Jung says, you could do just as well visualizing Tonto and the Lone Ranger. It doesn't matter who you visualize. There is a power in this technique that was taught to Carl Jung by his spirit guide, Philemon. That's where the power is. It's a methodology that opens you to the world of the occult. And it opens you to demonic entities, and they will pose as anything you want to call them. All right? Now, if this collective unconscious exists, then we're in touch with anybody out there. Let me read to you what Agnes Sanford wrote about speaking in tongues. And I'm astonished that uh, charismatic friends get upset when I tell them where Agnes Sanford got her ideas. And, uh, well, listen to it. She says, now in the speaking with tongues, <clears throat> this power latent in the unconscious mind of all people is quickened so that the unconscious mind may make rapport with the unconscious mind of someone else living anywhere upon this earth or of someone who has lived before, that is, the dead, or someone who will yet live in the future or even of some great messenger of light from heaven the devil himself who transforms himself into an angel of light. This is union psychology, all right? Now, I've overspent my time uh, on, on psychology. The basic model of man, says Lawrence Lachan, who is a past president of the uh, Association for Humanistic Psychology, the basic model of man that led to the development of Eastern meditational techniques is the same model that led to the humanistic psychotherapy, the model for humanistic psychotherapy. And Dr. Lashan calls psychotherapy, he says it will probably be known as the hoax of the 20th century. How do you like that? You've been ripped off. Lucis Trust, and some of you know they're a key element in the New Age movement. One of their writers said, there's a new psychology that's emerging, the... the, the psychologists in the West are now learning from the gurus in the East and we're realizing the spirituality putting it together this new psychology is preparing humanity for a new age for a new civilization and so forth this is Science of Mind Church of Religious Science a magazine psychology for the new age an interview with a psychologist in here Martin Gross again says today the MD psychiatrist and his first cousin the PhD psychologist have appointed themselves the undisputed Solomons of our era. The new seer delivers his pronouncements with the infallible air of a papal bull, a stance which intimidates even the most confident of laymen. E. Fuller Torrey says, and these are all non-Christians now, psychiatry has been willing to sanctify its values with the holy water of medicine and offer them up as the true faith of mental health. It is a false messiah. It is a religion. And, well, how do they depict themselves? This was the 1985 annual meeting for the Association of Hum for Humanistic Psychology. Change agents is what they call themselves. Change agents. They are going to change the thinking of society. This happens to be the 22nd annual, uh, this is 22nd annual meeting, Association for Humanistic Psychology. These are humanists, atheists, the daily schedule. Early morning begins yoga, tai chi, meditation. Are they into the East? Are they into mysticism? Indeed, they are. That's where its roots are, and they are going uh, full bore into this. The pre-conference and post-conference institutes you could have taken, about half of them were blatant uh, mysticism. Trance states and healing... Uh, shamanic ecstasy and transformation, being the wizard you are. And I think I referred to one in a question and answer time, education as alchemy. How to change the spirits and the minds of your children in public school. This was the 
1986, it was the 24th annual meeting of the Association for Humanistic Psychology. It met at San Diego State University August 14th through 17th. Would you like to know one of the magazines in which they advertised? You've, most of you, I'm sure, if any of you have ever seen this magazine, Shaman's Drum. It's, an, it's a journal of experiential shamanism, a pretty slick magazine all about witchcraft. It's for people who are into this thing. Who do you think advertises in there? The Association for Humanistic Psychology advertises in there. And they say, come and hear an unforgettable opportunity to learn from some of the most important healers and spiritual leaders in West Africa and Brazil. Well, you know who they are. They're witch doctors. And in fact, the Los Angeles Times had a picture of one of the witch doctors putting one of the co-presidents of the Association for Humanistic Psychology, which I will hereafter call the AHP to save a little time, uh, putting him into a trance. But this is all accepted today because Carl Jung gave us an explanation that really does away with any reality. You see, you're not really in touch with demons. So don't worry about demons anymore, folks. It's just an archetypal image from the collective unconscious. You're tapping into a power that the human race has. But don't think there's a God out there, or there's a devil out there, or there are real demons. But you're dealing with the power of the imagination. A couple of PhDs, what were they talking about? Journey into altered states of consciousness where one, listen to this carefully, can meet one's higher spirit teachers and the gods themselves. You understand what these people are into? This is an official ad by the Association for Humanistic Psychology in Shaman's Drum, and they're telling you, we'll put you in touch with the gods themselves. We want you shamans and witch doctors to join our organization because that's what we're into. Another PhD will talk about trance states used by shamans to diagnose and heal disease. Uh, topics include vision and transformation, ritual, meditation, shamanism, the chakra system, altered states of consciousness, mediumship. Here is the official program of that uh, 24th uh, annual convention. I'll just read you one. We're, well, shamanism and spirit healing. Um, here's, here's another one. Mediumship and extension of consciousness. You know what a medium is. They go into a trance and they communicate with the spirits of the dead, supposedly. These people are involved in this. Mediumship, the ability to contact the spiritual world, is explored as a natural characteristic of all human beings through processes facilitated by the Institute leaders. Participants will have an opportunity to, to experience and explore communications with guides and other spiritual friends. The relationship between mediumship and personality and its use as an instrument of growth and peace will be explored. Now, we can understand that. It's out in the world. These are godless people. How did it come into the church? Christian psychology. What is Christian psychology? I said I would tell you that there is no such thing as Christian psychology. Have you ever taken, any of you taken psychology in university? Did you ever look up in the index in any of your psychology textbooks? Did you go through any library anywhere in the world and try to find one listing for Christian psychology? It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Because there's no Christian who is known as the Freud or the Jung or the Rogers or the Maslow of a field of psychology called Christian psychology. Let me read you a statement from two leading Christian psychologists at a symposium, a seminar of leading Christian psychologists. And they said, a widespread, I'm sorry, let me get the right quote here. We are often asked if we are Christian psychologists and find it difficult to answer since we don't know what the question implies. We are Christians who are psychologists, but at the present time, listen to this carefully. This is not Dave Hunt the critic telling you these are two leading Christian psychologists. At the present time, there is no acceptable Christian psychology that is markedly different from non-Christian psychology. You were taught there was a difference. It's different.
different from this stuff out there. It is not different from that stuff out there. Christian psychology is an attempt to reach out there and take some of the theories of godless people, dress it up in biblical language, and bring it into the church and say that what the Bible is missing, psychology has offered to us. Dennis Bennett, for example, in the foreword of one of his wife's books on inner healing, says, When I was saved, that solved some of my problems. When I was baptized in the Spirit, that solved some more. But that still left me with some hang-ups that only inner healing could reach. And Rita Bennett says, what is inner healing? It's soul healing. What is the soul? It's the psych... She says, I define it as the psychological nature. Now we've got new terms. We've got new diagnoses for new problems that the church never heard of that are not listed in the Bible. But they're psychological problems. Of course, they require a psychological solution. And unfortunately, the Holy Spirit, through ignorance or oversight, fails to inspire Paul and, 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 and Peter and the apostles and the prophets who wrote the New Testament with all that we need. But fortunately, he has lately inspired these godless atheists, Jung and Freud and Rogers and Maslow, with a part of God's truth. See, you will hear this. All truth is God's truth. And we'll take it from the devil himself. What do you mean by truth? Well, you mean the general uh, uh, truth about the universe? So that uh, uh, an Einstein who doesn't know God can come up with E equals MC squared? Or do you mean spiritual truth? Into those things that pertain unto life and godliness. Are we talking about Jonas Salk inventing a polio vaccine? Or are we talking about how to be godly and how to have the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. What more do you need? Let's turn to it just very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Well, chapter 1, he talks about the wisdom of the world, its foolishness with God. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. And then in chapter 2, he talks about the wisdom of God that is spoken in a mystery that is only understood by spiritual people. It is only discerned by the Holy Spirit. And that those who are carnally minded cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. But now we are being told that there are godless, carnally minded men who have received an inspiration of part of God's truth that godly men didn't understand. Let me quote Bruce Naramore, if I can find it here. Nephew of Clyde Naramore. He's the director of the Rosemead Graduate School of Psychology in Southern California. He says, under the influence of humanistic psychologists like Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, many of us Christians have begun to see our need for self-love and self-esteem. You see, they didn't learn it from the Bible. They learned it from godless humanists. And they became convinced by them, and then they went to the Bible to try to find some proof texts that would support this. So what has happened? We have what I hesitate to call a cult, but it certainly is near a cult within the Church of Jesus Christ. It has its own priesthood. The PhDs, the MDs, the psychiatrists, who practice what they picked up out there and now have biblicized it. They've got their own vocabulary. They've got their own diagnosis for, for problems that were unknown. And you and I can't argue with them. We can't be Bereans. We can't go to the Bible. We can't go to Isaiah 8.20 that says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. Because this word isn't, doesn't contain all of God's truth. And there may be something that Freud or Jung or Rogers has said out there that you and I don't know about. So how can we be like the Bereans who question Paul on the basis of the word of God? So they've got a whole new vocabulary. They've got their own rituals, their own solutions that nobody else knows. And... A large church of this size is not complete without a psychologist on the staff. And let me tell you what it has come to now. A pastor who has a degree in theology, for example, is competent to preach or teach from the Bible. But listen carefully, he is not competent to counsel from the Word of God. Here is Clyde Naramore on the 700 Club being interviewed by Pat Robertson. 
And Pat says, Clyde, what do you think about someone like Jay Adams? By the way, he's written a new book that I would recommend to you, The Biblical View of Self-Love, Self-Esteem, and Self-Image, something like that. And, you know, Jay Adams says if you're a Christian, you're filled with the Spirit, you're mature in the faith, you know the Word of God, you're competent to counsel from the Word of God. And Clyde gets a rather patronizing look on his face, and he says, well, you understand, of course, he doesn't have a degree. Well, you just threw Peter out, and you threw Paul out, and you threw Jesus out, and you threw Andrew Murray and Tory and Moody and Spurgeon, and you threw everybody out. What do you mean he doesn't have a degree? He teaches in a theological seminary. He has several degrees. Since when was a degree in psychology necessary to be competent to handle the Word of God? Well, now you're all saying amen, but let me turn it back on you now, because part of the problem is with the body of Christ. We need counseling. We need biblical counseling. And there are people who are hurting, and they need help. And you know, one of the things that people are looking for within a church is love. They're looking for friendship. They're not looking for just a, a hug, glad to see you, Sunday morning. But they want people who will keep track of them during the week. There ought to be mature Christian, older couples, mature in the faith, who will take under their wing and spend time with younger couples who are having marital problems or financial problems. The healing of these needs is not going to take place in an hour of counseling, and you're going to kill your pastor if you think he can handle all of these things. It's going to take place within the body of Christ, loving people who are living out and who are bearing one another's burdens and who are living real Christianity before the world. But I'll tell you, we've got to be very careful also that we don't give false solutions to people. Doesn't it seem a bit odd that the saints of old grew strong through trial? Talk about rejection. Rejected, hated, tormented, tortured. They grew strong through trial. But now we've got to coddle people. We've got to give them months and months of psychotherapy if their mother didn't change the diaper soon enough for them. If they felt rejected as a child, Somehow, it is not biblical. I'm not saying we shouldn't support the weak and bear the infirmities of those who need our help. We should. But you know, God brings us through trials sometimes to strengthen us. The psalmist in Psalm 23 didn't say, Yea, though I come up to the valley of the shadow of death, thank God you give me an escape route around it. He said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And we've got to beware that we don't take people out of a situation that God has placed them in to make them strong and, and to make them grow in the faith so that they can be an example and that they can win others for the Lord. I just want to close, if I can find it here, with a man. I don't know if you've read this book. It goes way back when Iron Gates Yield. His name was Jeffrey Bull. He was taken prisoner by the communists when they took over communist China. They tortured him. They brainwashed him. They tried to destroy his faith. They tried to get him to sign a false confession that he was an agent of the, of the capitalists, the imperialists. And if he didn't, it would be a, 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 a firing squad in the morning at sunrise. And he was in fear and trembling until he realized, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead. They can't kill me. I'm done away with. My life is hid with Christ and God. they got no power over me. And he was delivered. But he writes this. After this experience, he says, My mind had been so battered and was now so fatigued that I hardly knew how to think. Yet, as in that dark cell my vision cleared, I could not explain it, nor did I need to do so. I knew that I believed my Savior risen from the dead. I knew he was the Son of God. I knew he had shed his blood for me. I had been shaken, torn, and wounded. But I was conscious still that round about me were his everlasting arms. I knew within my heart the witness of his spirit, triumphant still, standing yet inviolable to all the foe's assault. I knew that underneath my feet, impregnable, unshaken, and strong as ever, was the rock of ages, Jesus Christ my Lord. And there as I sat from the very well springs of my soul, surged up the words that God is pleased to honor above all human utterance, I believe. I believe. He came through triumphant. Let us do the same in our day, and let us not look to the broken cisterns. My people have committed two evils, God said. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They've dug out broken cisterns that can't hold water. Let's get back to the Lord himself and back to his word 
And let's be triumphant in what He gives us of Himself to be our very life. You're tuned in with the Underground Christian Network. You're tuned in with the Underground Christian Network. I don't know how many of you have heard the story of... Uh, and I, I never tell stories just to tell stories. I hope you know that. They always have a message. Like the golfer this morning, you know. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard the story of the airplane that was going down and there were five people aboard and only four parachutes. Any of you know that story? Okay. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and the question, of course, was who was going to get the parachutes? There was a general, a colonel, uh, Henry Kissinger, a hippie, and the pilot. And, um, well, the general said that he was in charge of the Pentagon, and without him, the United States would be defenseless. So, naturally, he ought to have a parachute. So, he strapped on a parachute and he jumped out. And the colonel said that he was in charge of NORAD, North American Aviation Defense, and without him, the missiles would be flying in. And so, he strapped on a parachute and he jumped out. Henry Kissinger said, well, he was the man that brought peace to the world, and besides that, he was the smartest man in the whole world, and without him, the whole world was finished. So he strapped on, he jumped out. Well, the pilot wanted to be fair about this thing, so he came back and he said to the hippie, what do we do? There's only one shoot left for two of us, shall we flip for it? And the hippie said, hey man, that's cool, we're okay. Smartest man in the world, just strapped my knapsack on and jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> Our society has literally strapped on a hippie's knapsack and jumped out. I hope you understand that by now from what we've been talking about. This whole thing began with those who dropped out to tune in and turn on with drugs, reached altered states of consciousness, achieved an alternate reality that eventually became the reality and anybody who wasn't stoned was out of it and that opened the door to Eastern mysticism you remember and the gurus flooded our shores each one sent by his guru to convert the world to Hinduism and we moved on into the graduate school of sorcery which is Eastern mysticism and this is really the foundation of what we've been talking about the new age movement which is nothing new, it's the same old occultism. What is new is the astonishing respectability and credibility that it has gained in every area of our society. And tonight, we are supposed to talk about what do we do about this New Age movement. Um, I'm going to try to be brief tonight, believe it or not. That may seem impossible, and it may turn out to be. Um, but um, I'd like to leave time for as many questions as possible. Let's turn to Matthew 13. But I'm going to try to illustrate, give you a few illustrations of what I think we ought to do. Remember, we said if there's one scripture that we would take as the scripture for the theme of our time together, these five messages, I guess, there have been um, it would be Acts 26.18 when Jesus arrested Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and he turned him into Paul the apostle he sent him out to do three things and he told him specifically what they were he said I'm sending you out there to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Open their eyes. You've got to open people's eyes. You've got to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And only then did he say that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those that are sanctified through faith that is in me. So first of all, 
you've got to understand a little bit of what's going on out there. And I would suggest to you that you don't start out by arguing with people. If somebody's involved in Est or uh, Ekankar uh, or Mahikari uh, or whatever it may be, um, don't begin by arguing with them and telling them everything that's wrong when you don't know anything about it. You're only going to prove your ignorance and you will prove to them what they've been taught that they're enlightened and everyone else uh, is in ignorance. What you need to do is love them, keep contact with them if this is a family member or a friend because one thing that um, a cult or the, uh, will do is to isolate them from you and remove contact, pray for them, and you can begin by asking questions. If you've ever seen two people in a conversation, not always, but quite often, neither one is listening to the other, and each one is waiting until the other one pauses to take a breath and jumps in to say what he or she wants to say, and then the other one waits, uh, begin to show a genuine interest in people. Begin to ask questions, and that's the way to find out what they're into. And learn something about what they believe, and how they got there, and where they think it's taking them, and why. And then you can begin to ask leading questions. You can ask questions that will not only tell you what they believe, but will help to expose the fact to themselves that they don't really have the answers that they've been seeking. Let me give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine was one of the founding members of the Hare Krishna movement in uh, this country. And uh, he was uh, with them, I think, for about nine years, editor-in-chief of their magazine for three years, back to Godhead. And he became interested. I'll tell you, one of the things that that um, captures the attention of a lot of these people is prophecy, believe it or not. And they begin to wonder, why doesn't the Book of Mormon talk about what's going to happen in the last days? Uh, why don't the Vedas tell us about Israel returning to her land and the Soviet Union up there and the great uh, Arab Confederacy and, and, and the Ten Nation Confederacy in Western Europe? This is one of the things that attracted his attention on Christian television. And he called up one day uh, to ask questions, and I would have thought that he would get some little old lady in tennis shoes who didn't know anything about Eastern mysticism. You know, that's how negative I am. Uh, I said that one evening at a meeting, and afterwards the little old lady came up and, <laughs> and said to me, I am the little old lady you were talking about, and I have been into everything. And I just met Jesus a couple of years ago, you know. Well, he got someone who had been into the East, who had been into TM, Transcendental Meditation. And this person just asked questions. He said, what are you into? Well, I'm in the Hare Krishna movement. Well, uh, what are you there for? Uh, well, I'm disillusioned with materialism and with the lust in the world, and, and I want to be delivered from desire, and I want to live a holy life and I want to know God some of these people are really sincerely seeking and the voice on the other end of the line said well have you found what you're looking for now you see if a person is not ready to receive the truth one of the things you need to pray those of you that have friends who are involved in cults or the old cult the new age movement whatever one of the things you need to pray is that they will be disillusioned disillusioned with the others that they see, disillusioned with themselves and their own search, disillusioned with their guru. And if Ed had been, had not been disillusioned, had not been ready, then he would have blustered and said, oh yes, I found what I'm looking for, I'm very happy and so forth. But the very fact that he'd called indicated that there, he knew there was something missing. And so he said, no, I have not. And the person on the other end of the line said, Do you know anyone in the movement who has? And again, he was honest enough to say, No, I do not know. In fact, he had been brought to this point when a close friend of his who was in charge of a Hare Krishna temple had walked into a lake in January in the, in the Midwest 
and went out there up to his neck with a 45 in one hand and his prayer beads in the other and blew out his brains. Now, he had tried to, you know, there's over a 90% divorce rate in, the, in ISKCON, in the Hare Krishna movement. And he had tried to rationalize this by saying, well, there's nothing wrong with philosophy. The problem is with us. We can't live it. But he was honest enough to admit nobody in the movement has found what we're looking for including the guru himself. He eats off of gold plates six times a day, you know. But of course, and, and we're sleeping on, on cement floors and we're denying ourselves and so forth. But of course, when food comes to him, it's transcendental, you understand. Uh, because he has achieved that state, you know. But you can see through that. There are chinks in his armor and you realize that it's not as you think or as you had hoped. And Ed said, no, I don't know of anybody. And the voice on the other end of the line said, you know, I was in Eastern mysticism and I was searching for what you're searching for too. And I didn't find it until I met Jesus. And I found in him what I was looking for. And it was a very simple statement of who Jesus is and why he came. He didn't come to Christ that day. He came to Christ driving along the freeway in Los Angeles, 65 miles an hour, heading for the only Christian that he knew, a young lady who was into Islam, but she was also part of the Worldwide Church of God. And he thought that was Christianity. And uh, the Lord met him on the freeway in his car. He was born again. And when he arrived, at, knocked at her door, he said, I just got saved. And she said, well, now you understand, of course, that Herbert W. Armstrong is the only one who knows what the Bible really says. And the truth has not been preached for 18 and a half centuries on this earth till he began his broadcast in 1934. And you've got to keep the law and you've got to do this and that. And he stood there for a few minutes. This is a brand new babe in Christ. He said, that's not the Jesus that I met. And he turned and left. Now, a person whose heart is right and who has understood the message is going to be delivered from deception. And that's one of the things we want to emphasize tonight again. Matthew 13, we won't take time to read it. You know, it's, you're familiar with it, most of you. It's the parable of the sower who went out to sow and he, the first seed that he sowed fell by the wayside that was where the plowed soil had been trampled down with the footsteps of those that walked across it so the seed couldn't sink in and the birds of the air came and took that seed away and the disciples asked Jesus what does this mean and in verse 18 he says hear ye therefore the parable of the sower when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't get excited enough about it doesn't go forward and doesn't cry and doesn't get emotional enough about it is that what it says when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, what? Understandeth it not. Understandeth it not. Then comes that wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. The Bible tells me that Satan takes right out of people's hearts the seed that has been sown. You wonder why somebody seems enthusiastic? And they're all excited and they come to Jesus and a few months or a few years later they fall by the wayside because basically they did not understand. They didn't know the commitment they were being called to make. They had a mistaken idea of who God is, of who Jesus is, of what salvation is and they made an emotional decision and they had no real root because they had no understanding. And so Jesus told Saul that he had to go out there and open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light and snatch them out of the grasp of Satan, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those that are sanctified through faith that is in me. If you turn back to 1 John chapter 5, <clears throat> In verse 19, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the wicked one. The whole world lies 
in the wicked one. Some people will say, well, that's being very dogmatic. Isn't that presumptive? Isn't that judgmental to say that you know God, but other people don't? This is what the Bible teaches. If, you, if I'm a medical doctor and you come to me and you've got a ruptured appendix and uh, you're going to die if you're not on that operating table within the next 30 minutes, but I wouldn't want to offend you, you understand? <laughs> I mean, it might upset you if I told you that. So instead I tell you, oh, you've got such a rosy glow in your cheeks. I mean, you're raging with fever, 105. But I say, oh, what a rosy, healthy glow in your cheeks. I mean, uh, let me give you some aspirin and you'll be quite all right. Uh, because I wouldn't want to upset you. Some people have that idea, believe it or not. We speak in love to people, but we speak the truth in love. And if I really love a person, I will tell them the truth. And if you think that you're uh, exercising love or demonstrating love to someone by not offending them, by telling them the truth, then you are sadly mistaken. Because unless they know the truth, they're going to be lost forever. And if you're really concerned about a person, you want to tell them the truth. And remember, the battle is between the truth and the lie. So something that you've got to do about this movement is to stand up and be bold enough to tell people to tell it like it is. Lovingly, compassionately, carefully, but in a way that they can understand, in a way that they won't make any mistake about what you're trying to say. You've got to make the message clear and open their eyes. The scripture here says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the wicked one. Now that reminds us of a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hold your finger in 1 John 5 and turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. And verse 29. This is a verse that the Mormons love to use. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And the Mormons will say, you see, the Bible teaches baptism for the dead. We baptize for the dead. You Christian churches don't baptize for the dead. Therefore, we follow the truth and we follow the Bible and you do not. Well, what is this verse saying? If you read the verse the verses that precede it, you'll find he's talking about I and we, verse 15, we. Uh, he's talking about you, you Christians, we, we members of the body of Christ, about us and so forth. And then suddenly in verse 29 he says, And what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they baptized for the dead? And then in verse 30 he comes back and he says, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? There's a difference between the we in verse 30 and the they in verse 29. It's not the Christians who baptize for the dead. It's the pagans. It's the members of the mystery religions who baptize for the dead. And Paul is simply pointing them to them and saying, look, even the members of the mystery religions, even the pagans must believe in life after death because they baptize for the dead. He's not saying we baptize for the dead. Then he comes back and he changes. There's a difference between them and us. And going back to uh, 1 John chapter 5, we get that same thought. We know that we are of God. The whole world lies in the wicked one. They and we. And then verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us a terrific mystical experience. Is that what it says? We know that the Son of God has come and has given us what? Has given us an understanding. Has given us an understanding. Why? That we may know him that is true. That we may know him that is true. And the implication is surely clear that if we do not have this understanding, we do not really know him. And remember, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 
He has given us an understanding, not a great mystical experience. We mentioned a little bit about the experiences of the clinically dead, and somebody asked me about it uh, before the meeting this evening. I think it's worth talking about a little more. You know, we have to be very careful basing our ideas upon experiences. You, some of you have been on drugs, and you've had all kinds of experiences. The question is, what is real? Do you have an objective criteria for evaluating your experience? And there are those that's become very popular in certain circles within the church for people to travel around who have been to heaven and they've been to hell, and now on this basis uh, they're going to warn sinners uh, and uh, people are going to believe in the hereafter because of their experience. There are a number of problems with this idea. If I am here to tell you how I was taken to hell and uh, to warn you people about this, what are you going to do? Why would you believe my experience when uh, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says she now has 20,000 testimonies of clinically dead people who didn't go to hell at all? They heard a buzzing sound, went through a tunnel, came out into a beautiful landscape and were met by a being of light who expressed warmth and love, unconditional love and acceptance, no matter what sins they had committed. And they came back from that experience to say, there is no death, I'm not afraid to die. Why would you believe my experience? And if you come to believe in hell on the basis of my experience, and one day you come up against dozens of other people who had a different experience. Won't that destroy your faith? It's not biblical. It's not only not logical, but it's not biblical. You remember Jesus told the rich man and Lazarus, in hell he lift up his eyes being in torment, and he pleaded with Abraham. He said, please send Lazarus, the beggar, back. I've got five brothers send him back to warn them. I don't want them to come to this place. Do you remember what Jesus said, Abraham said? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. For if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe the one came back from the dead. But now we have people traveling around who say, oh yes, they will believe because I went to hell and came back and this is the great testimony to tell people now and on this basis people will surely believe what they wouldn't believe by reading the Bible. You say, well, I'll take what uh, this particular person says because it's biblical. Well, if it's biblical, then why don't you take it from the Bible? I don't read that Lazarus, after, he, uh, after Jesus raised him from the dead, went traveling around to the Full Gospel Businessmen or the CBMC uh, in Palestine giving his testimony of what it was like on the other side and, and telling people about this. I read that when Paul was called up to the third heaven, he heard words that it was not lawful that for him to utter. He couldn't tell people about it. It was left by the Holy Spirit to inspire John in the book of Revelation to tell us what God wanted us to know about heaven. But we have people today saying, well, I was caught up into heaven and now I'm going to tell you what Paul couldn't tell you and I'm going to improve on what John has told you and what God thought that it was necessary for us to know in the book of Revelation. I'm not trying to be critical. You understand what I'm saying? But one thing you're going to have to do about the deception that's sweeping our world is to begin to be critical and begin to be logical and be biblical and think for yourself. As I said, I don't want to be your guru. Don't believe it because I say so. You check it out for yourselves. Check it out with the Word of God. The Lord has given you a mind. He's given you a conscience. He's given you His Word. He's given you His Spirit, those of you that know Him. And He expects us to have understanding. Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 4, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Get understanding. Now, he says, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us not a mystical experience. I'm not against experiences. I've had some tremendous experiences with God. But that's not the emphasis in Scripture. Has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. 
and we are in him that is true. How are we in him that is true? Like a drop of water dissolves into the ocean and, and we've lost our identity and we become one in this mystical way as, as <clears throat> Eastern mysticism would teach. No, Jesus made it very clear. We are branches in the true vine. We are in him like the branches in the vine. And he is in us like the life of the vine is in the branch. The branch is not the vine, <clears throat> and the vine is not the branch. We are separate and distinct, yet we have been joined together in one, in his life. And his, his life has become our life. And what the branch needs to do is keep an open channel and allow the life of the vine to pour through and produce the fruit. That's the oneness that we have in the Word of God, not a mystical union. And so again, when somebody gives you some idea that's not biblical, you've got to know the Word of God. If you know the Word of God, then you understand that what they're teaching is not true. We've talked about psychology, and I'm going to talk a bit more before we're through this evening, uh, if, if I can get to it. <clears throat> there again, you need to be logical. See, the problem is that it has been believed that this is somehow scientific. It's a pseudoscience. It's riddled with contradiction and confusion. It is, in fact, a rival religious system. And there's no way you can possibly unite it with Christianity. Just turn very quickly. And let me give you some examples from the scripture that I think would be helpful. Turn back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Just read a few verses. Verse, pick it up in the middle of verse 4. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh. Here they put off thy shoes from off thy feet. And moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, and so forth. Moses hid his face. And listen, pick it up at verse 7 now. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt, to bring them up out of that land into a good land, and a large, unto a land pouring with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, and so forth. Now therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel. I have seen the oppression. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said, It's about time you realize who I am. It's about time you realize what a great deliverer I am. I was wondering when you'd finally get around to recognizing me. No, Moses says, who am I? I'm no deliverer, Lord. I can't do it. I'm no good. And then in chapter 4, he said, I can't even speak. Well, you know what God said to him. We don't even have to read it. We know what God said because it's taught all through the church. Why, well, he said, Moses, your problem is you've got a bad self-image. You're down on yourself. You're lacking in self-confidence. And I'm going to give you about six months of Christian psychology. I'm going to have you go to a Christian counselor. And we're going to teach you how to love yourself and accept yourself and feel good about yourself. We're going to develop a good self-image. And I'm going to send you to some positive mental attitude training seminars out there. And we're going to teach you how to use body language and how to get people to do what you want them to do by psychologically programming them. And Moses, you're going to make a fantastic deliverer. Is that what he said? It's what you're being taught in the church. It's being taught in the world around you and you're being taught it in the church. What did he say to Moses? He didn't deal with this supposed bad self-image. It wasn't a bad self-image. Moses was being realistic. What did God say? He said, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you, Moses. And we are being robbed of the presence and power of God in our lives by turning to ourselves. Self-love, self-acceptance, self-development, self-confidence, self ad nauseum. And I don't want to run this thing into the ground, but it is not biblical. And if Moses had listened, did you hear what we read? He would have heard that God said, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. 
I am concerned about them, Moses, and I have come down to deliver them, and I'm going to give you the privilege of being my instrument to do this. See, we get the big idea about ourselves. Maybe you heard the story of the donkey that Jesus rode on to go into Jerusalem. And that was in the stable that evening, you know, after Palm Sunday. And it was in the stable that evening, talking with the other donkeys like donkeys do. And, and this donkey was saying, Wow, you should have seen the reception that I got today. Wow, they threw their garments out and for me to step on. They were waving palm branches over my head. And I never knew who my father was. But I found out today, they were all yelling, Son of David! Son of David! And you know what? I think they're going to make me king! Sure. The Lord just tries to use us in some little way and we think that the focus is upon ourselves. And self is the problem. And Jesus said you must deny self. Take up the cross and follow me. Give up life as you would live it. Come and accept my death as your death. And come into the grave and come out the other side in the power of my resurrection. Let me live my life through you. What was the turning point in Job's life? We won't take time to turn to it. The last chapter in the book of Job, Job says, I've heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, and now mine eye see thee. Wherefore, I really feel good about myself, Lord. Uh, there was a number in the Los Angeles Times, and it said if you called, there would be a recording that would tell you how to feel good about yourself. What did Job say? He said, I've heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, and now mine eye see thee. Wherefore, I hate myself and I repent in dust and ashes. People say, well, but Paul had a good self-image. Yeah, he sure did. He said he was the chief of sinners. He said, in me there dwells no good thing. He said, the will is present with me, but how to perform I wot not. He said, I just can't do it, Lord. And Jesus said to Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you are weak enough to know you can't do it, and you're realistic enough to recognize that I must be your all, then you're in a position where I can begin to use you. Why did God have to cut Gideon's band down from thousands to three hundred? Lest Israel vaunt herself and say, We have delivered ourselves by our own hand. And God would not have the glory. And God wants to have the glory in your life. And you're never going to be able to stand before the Lord someday and say, well, I know that it's wonderful about grace and forgiveness and, and all of this, but Lord, in the final analysis, you did it because I was worth it. Some of us are being taught that, well, you couldn't believe that God really loved you unless you realized that you, had, that you were worth something. That's the Hollywood idea of love. We love the lovely and the lovable and the beautiful. God loved a world of sinners lost and ruined by the fall. He loved us in spite of who we are, not because we are so beautiful and worthy of his love. People say, well, but if we weren't worth something, God wouldn't have paid, Jesus wouldn't have died for us. Look the price he paid. Oh, you think he got a bargain? You're going to value yourself on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and you think he paid true value for you? No. That was paid to satisfy the justice of Almighty God. We offended infinite justice, and we owed a debt we could never pay, and it would require us to be separated forever and forever and forever because we're finite beings. God is infinite. He could pay the debt, but it wouldn't be just because he's not a member of our race. So God became a man through the virgin birth. And he never ceased to be God, and he will never cease to be man. He's the one and only God-man. And because of who Jesus is, he was able to do what he did, pay a debt we could never pay. And on that basis, God has been satisfied. He paid the debt, and we can be forgiven and have eternal life as a free gift. Well, there are lies that deny this everywhere. 
And the whole New Age movement in a nutshell we've talked over it as the human potential movement, as the consciousness movement, it's the Aquarian conspiracy, uh, on down the line. Everything out there is a denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to just quickly, before we have questions and answers, I want to just read you quickly just a few things. Because I, somehow I brought up a big stack every time and I never got to it. So I brought up a little stack this time. I wish you could read some of the letters that I get. Here's a letter from a man, and he's very desperate. He says, Mr. Hunt, I've got to get in touch. I've got to write to you. I've got to get an answer from you. We've got a new pastor in our church, and some strange things are beginning to happen. Now, this was an evangelical church. Uh, first of all, the pastor wants the choir to sing some songs that were written by David Spangler. Now, most of you don't know who David Spangler is. Uh, David Spangler is on the board of a planetary initiative for the world we choose that comes out of the United Nations, one of the large New Age networks. David Spangler has written uh, in his book Reflections on the Christ that Lucifer is the same force as Christ. It's Lucifer who leads us into our Christhood. And it's Lucifer who leads us into the final initiation, an initiation into the New Age, which is a Luciferian initiation. He says some truth in there. In that book, he says, you want to know who leads us into a sense of self-worth and self-acceptance and self-loving ourselves? That's Lucifer's job, too, he says. And I say, David, you got the message right that time. If you want to know the final, what the Bible has to say, the last word on self-esteem, go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each esteem others better than himself. And he went on in this letter, and he said, furthermore, he wants to start a holistic health center. Mind, body, spirit, and we've talked about that, and I won't go back into that. Those of you that were not here, you can get the tapes. And then he said, and he's talking about a new kind of healing with laying on of hands called Reiki. It's a God power, R-E-I-K-I. I have a letter from a woman. Well, I have a Reiki brochure here that says it's a Japanese word meaning universal life energy. Um, it says that this is God power. And we draw it into our bodies and then by laying on of hands, if we have been initiated and we know how to do it, um, we can heal other people. Here's a letter from a Christian lady. Uh, it's too long. I can't begin to read it. She says, I just finished reading your book, Peace, Prosperity, and the Coming Holocaust for the third time this week. I've been checking footnotes, references, and so forth. And she says on page 214 of your book, you discuss 666, and you talk about the God of Force, and so forth. She says, the following story may prove of interest. And I can't even get into that part of the letter. But she tells how she was initiated into Reiki. She got up to the third level. She says, there is a real power. She says, I had a power in my hands. Even animals could feel it. And they loved it. And when I realized that this was demonic, and there were other Christians who were involved in this, and we couldn't get rid of this power in our hands. We had something there. And it was only by deliverance and renunciation that they were delivered from something that they got into. you got all kinds of these things out there, folks. Here's a letter from a young woman, but I can find it very quickly. Macrobiotics. I've seen a lot of that on Christian television. It's a fine diet. What could be wrong with beans and rice? Well, she says, I went back to Boston uh, to be at Michio Kushi's school, the founder of macrobiotics, um, she says, um, we were taught all about vegetarianism and yin and yang. Food was the main theology. If you ate in harmony, your life would be in harmony and reflect your diet. I changed my worldview to include spiritism. We saw spirits of the dead, dead relatives. My paternal grandfather's spirit came and stood near me when I was to help me eat correctly, that is, macrobiotically. I made a common practice to visit a tea leaf reader. I got involved in I Ching and had my palm read and it got involved in astrology. It was very pleasant, but there were some cracks. 
Uh, couples would divorce and have affairs, beat up their wives, but those incidents were attributed to karma. Only it was a Western definition, and they had to learn their lessons and so forth. She says, the summer that I was there, both John Denver and Dirk Benedict came to Boston to promote macrobiotics. They were ardent supporters. The leader, Michio Kushi, has dealt a lot with Sun Myung Moon. Uh, the people were very loving, but we were brought into spiritual bondage. Here's a new book put out by um, Reader's Digest. It's called Into the Unknown. Acupuncture, alchemy, aliens on this planet, ancient magic, astral bodies, astrology, divination, dowsing, ghosts, uh, witches, horoscopes, hypnosis, Nostradamus, palmistry, uh, shamanism, spiritualism, telepathy, voodoo, werewolves, witchcraft, xenocards, and so forth. That's just, you might as well get into it, folks. I mean, what could be more interesting? And it's all very innocent because we have demythologized it and there are no demons involved, you understand. Uh, another article in the Reader's Digest, self-hypnosis works. Indeed it does, but it's demonic. Another article in the Reader's Digest, mind over matter, new evidence on psychic phenomena. Another one in Reader's Digest, the doctor within us all. We talked about that, getting spirit guides, supposed imaginary uh, doctors that you can uh, get in contact with through visualization. Here's a most interesting one. I haven't looked it up in the American edition. Some of you might. I think it would be the same. It's July 1961 German edition of Reader's Digest. It's an article by Dr. Kirsten, who was Hitler's personal physician, and he tells how he was riding on a train uh, with Himmler. And they were going through uh, France, and such horrendous things were happening, such savagery and brutality that he couldn't bear it. And just to get away from it all, he went into the library, Himmler's library, on the train. And there, to his astonishment, he saw religious books. And he said, I asked him um, about, these, about these books. And um, where are we here? And... Um, he said, I need these books for my work. His face turned serious and solemn, and Kirsten says he knew that he was about to speak the name of his idol or his god. He says, Hitler has given me the order to develop the Bible of the new national socialistic religion. I don't understand that, Kirsten replied. Well, after the victory of the Third Reich, our Fuhrer will abolish Christianity and out of that rubble will erect the Germanic religion. We will keep the idea of God, but only in, a, in an a, a unclear way. And the fear will take the place of Christ as the Savior of mankind. Millions of people then will name the name of Hitler in their prayers. And in a hundred years, no one will know anything else except this new one world religion. Well, we've documented to you how we're in the process of that happening. Valley of the Sun self-help tape. The front cover says, your conscious mind hears beautiful, relaxing music, while your subconscious mind hears and acts on the suggestions behind the music. I was called by a medical doctor a couple of months ago from across the country, and he was very concerned. He said, have you heard of anything like this? I've got a patient who's been coming to me, and he's been under the care of a psychiatrist. And at first, the psychiatrist thought he was loony. Uh, he was schizophrenic because he claimed that he was hearing voices that broke and tapes were speaking to him, saying something that wasn't exactly, you know, audible. And the doctor said, the psychiatrist, check this out. He spent several months tracing this down, and he found that there was a subliminal message, and this man had been led step by step until he got to the final tape, and it said, you are now ready to meet Ram Dass. Baba Ram Dass, some of you know, being Richard Alpert, former professor at Harvard, friend of Timothy Leary's, who became a guru. I've got a most interesting thing here, and I'm winding this down now so we can have some questions. This is a book that was put out by, of all people, Stanford Alumni Association, edited by Peter Stansky, and the title is On 1984. And what they were doing was 
um, just analyzing the situation in the world today since this is 1984, and how does it stack up um, with the book, 1984 and its prophecies? He's a, he's a psychologist that's writing this particular order, uh, uh, article that I'm reading. He says, we've gotten way beyond what was predicted in 1984. Um, we have ways of making people do things without knowing that we're making them do them. Uh, a young lady that happened to arrange some meetings for me in Dallas, a Christian, fine Christian, and when I mentioned that at the meetings where she was sitting there in the audience, it suddenly clicked. She had written her master's thesis on that very thing. And yet, as a Christian, had not recognized what she was doing. That we're developing techniques. He tells of some experiments in here where two out of three people would electrocute a stranger if they were given the right psychological conditioning. He tells in here of an experiment they began and they, they picked a number of young men who were at the way at the top level as far as emotional stability and intelligence. And it was a simulation. Some of them pretended to be the jailers and some of them pretended to be the victims, you know, the jailed. It was going to be a two-week experiment. And it became so horrendous what happened, just role-playing, just pretending that they had to stop it at the end of six days to prevent mayhem. But he says something very interesting here. He says the most telling of Orwell's predictions are to be found not in the heavy-handed practices of the Ministry of Justice, but in the treatment program of the Ministry of Love. Shall I tell you why we brought you here? To cure you. To make you sane. Will you understand, Winston? Quoting from the book. He says, 25 years after Orwell put those words into the mouth of his fictional character, comparable words were pronounced to a Soviet dissident, Victor Feinberg, involuntarily committed to a Soviet mental hospital. Quote, Your release depends on your behavior, and your behavior to us means your political views. In all other respects, your behavior is perfectly normal. Your illness consists of dissenting opinions. As soon as you renounce them and adopt a correct point of view, we will let you go. Unquote. Then he says, The speaker was not a Communist Party political bureaucrat, was not somebody torturing him, but a psychiatrist working for the government. You say, well, that only happens in the Soviet Union. He says, when control is cloaked as cure, surveillance as a security service, repression as a rehabilitation program, civil liberties can be set aside and cherished freedoms put on hold without arousing resistance or rebellion. When it is being done for you and not to you, it is difficult to complain without feeling the guilt of the ungrateful. The new ideology of intervention and control is based on the presumed needs and deficiencies of sick, suffering, incompetent, dangerous individuals and not on the requirements of government for loyalty and obedience. Listen to this next sentence. So instead of punishment, torture, exile, and other tricks of the tyrant trade, we are seeing such tricks of the treatment trade, intervention as therapy, education, social service, reform, retraining, and rehabilitation. He says the current practitioners in our ministry of love, in our 1984 today, come from the ranks of the mental health establishment, psychiatry, and my own field, psychology. This is not Dave Hunt, that nut who's out there to shoot everybody down and find a demon under every bush. This is a psychologist who's writing this about his own profession, okay? social welfare agencies, education, and business. Americans are, as the fa social fabric of family, neighborhood, and community becomes stretched and frayed, ever more Americans are being turned over to institutional care providers. In a critical attack on the role of the mental health establishment as the new party of our 1984, investigative journalist Peter Schrag warns us of the insidious danger inherent in the unquestioning acceptance of its seemingly benign ideology. 
I have just a ex- brief excerpt, if you can bear with me another minute or two, out of a book that I would recommend you ought to read, every one of you, The Psychological Society. It's not written by a Christian. It's amazing. You know, I said this morning, the emperor is naked, folks. And we've got all the Christians lined up. What beautiful clothes psychology and psychiatry has. Oh, how beautiful it is. The emperor is naked. He doesn't have any clothes on. And I'm trying to be that little boy who stood in the crowd and said, the emperor is naked. And it doesn't make me popular. You know the power of the establishment? Because it has a stranglehold on our churches, it has a stranglehold on our seminaries, it has a stranglehold on our colleges, our Christian colleges. But listen to what this non-Christian says. He says, this book, the title is The Psychological Society by Martin L. Gross. This book is about the most anxious, emotionally insecure, and analyzed population in the history of man. It is also about that society's practitioners the psychiatrists and psychologists who have built an elaborate professional structure to cater to our emotional needs. The major change, of, major agent of change has been modern psychology. It sits at the very center of contemporary society as an international colossus whose professional millions number in the hundreds of thousands. What did we do before this happened? On the 700 Club, Clyde Naramore was being interviewed by Pat Robertson. And Pat said, Clyde, what do you think about people like Jay Adams? Jay Adams basically, his thesis is competent to counsel. If you're a Christian, you know the Lord, you're walking with the Lord, you're filled with the Spirit, you know the Word of God, you're competent to counsel. Clyde gets a rather patronizing look on his face and he says, well, you've got to understand, he doesn't have a degree. He just threw out Jesus and Paul and Peter and Charles Finney and Andrew Murray and Spurgeon and Torrey and Moody. What did we do before Freud and Fromm and Jung and Rogers and Maslow and all these godless, atheist, anti-Christians came along with their philosophy to tell us how to interpret the Bible and how to properly use it in counseling people? Oh, he doesn't have a degree. I was asked to speak with a group of elders at a church and they wanted to start a counseling service. And they said, well, we're looking for a Ph.D. And I said, why are you looking for a Ph.D.? Ph.D. in psychology. Well, we we want to charge for this. We can't afford to do this freely. And we want to charge for this. And uh, you have to be licensed by the state. So you have to have qualified people. People who are qualified by the state. I said, I don't believe this. Would you want the state to qualify and license your pastor and determine what courses he must take and what he's going to say to the people in his sermons is not biblical Christian counseling of an individual every bit as important as anything a pastor says. We have a crying need for, for, for counseling. I'm not against counseling. We have a crying need for counseling, but you know that the church is the largest referral agency to psychiatrists. And we've got psychiatrists going to psychiatrists and they can't straighten one another out. It's the largest percentage of any profession who are divorced, who, are, who are, have suicides, who have emotional problems, who are under the care of psychiatrists. And we are turning to this naked emperor talking about his beautiful clothes and we're looking to him to help us understand what the Bible means. I'm sorry, I get a little angry. He says its ranks include psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, clinical psychologists, psychotherapists, social workers, psychiatric nurses, social psychologists, guidance counselors, marriage and family therapists, educational psychologists, sensitivity tea group and encounter leaders and assorted lay therapists, Christian psychologists, and so forth. Listen to this, folks. This is not Dave Hunt, that old critic. This is Martin Gross. He's simply compassionately reporting what he has seen. He says it's experimental animals are an obliging even grateful human race. We live in a civilization in which, as never before, man is preoccupied with self. We have become fascinated with our madness, motivations, and our endless, sometimes wearying search for normality. Modern psychology and psychiatry seek to satisfy that fascination by offering us a full range of systems from the serious to the whimsical. 
with which we can understand our confused psyche and then seek to heal it. The contemporary psychological society is the most vulnerable culture in history. Its citizen is a new model of Western man, one who is dependent upon others for guidance as to what is real or false. In the unsure state of his mind, he's even doubtful of the authenticity of his own emotions. As the Protestant, this is not a Christian writing now, but listen to what he says, as the Protestant ethic, that's all he knows, as the Protestant ethic has weakened in Western society, the confused citizen has turned to the only other alternative he knows, the psychological expert who claims there is a new scientific standard of behavior to replace fading traditions. Mouthing the holy name of science, the psychological expert claims to know all. This new truth is fed to us continuously from birth to grave. I think we've got to wake up. We've got to get back to the Word of God as we've been trying to say. These ideas are infiltrating not only society, but the church. I was recently in Kansas City and while there I visited Shanti Nalaya. Shanti Nalaya is a Catholic retreat center. Ed Hayes, a priest, is in charge very highly regarded in the Catholic Church. Shanti Nalaya is supported by the Catholic Church, the diocese there in that area. I went out to visit Ed Hayes and I asked him, what's going on out here? I tried to be gentle with him. He said, well, we're, we're trying to, uh, um, uh, you know, respect all religions um, because in the prayer chapel, you had a little idol of Shiva. Now, Shiva is the destroyer, the representative of Satan, if there is one in, in Hinduism. You had a little idol of Buddha, and then you had a picture of Jesus with a little candle in front of each one. He said, we're trying to show, you know, that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. The Bible says he came to fulfill the law and the prophets and the things that went before I said, it doesn't say the things that went before. Oh, he said, oh, it doesn't? Well, uh," and it was a strange thing he said to me. He said, and I quoted a few verses for him, and he said, well, I I see that you you understand the Bible, you you know the Bible quite well, but uh, as a Catholic priest, I don't. I would have to look it up. But I'll take your word for it. Um, I said, nowhere in the Bible will you get the idea that Jesus came to fulfill the the false gods of the heathen and the false teachings and religions of the heathen. Israel was warned to have nothing to do, not to worship them. And I said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, it warns us about false gods and it says that the things, it says specifically that the things that the Gentiles offer to their gods, they offer to devils chapter 10 and I would not that you would have fellowship with devils and he went white Matthew Fox Dominican priest recently spoke to the bishops of America the Catholic Church and I'm not just jumping on Catholics I haven't talked about them at all talking about what's going on in Protestant circles as well Matthew Fox is a outright occultist. He's got a witch uh, teaching at his college. He is as straight, lying, and occultist as you could possibly get. But you will find Matthew Fox's books in almost every Catholic bookstore and in many Christian bookstores. One of the things that upset Constance Cundy one day, and a lot of things have upset her, Uh, she walked into Logos Bookstore in Seattle. They would not sell her book over the counter. You had to ask for it. And they would only sell it to you if you took along with it some critical reviews and the package was sealed, it was stapled shut, and you didn't open it till you left the store. But they had books by Matthew Fox on the shelf. Occult books. That's kind of upsetting, isn't it? Well, let's wake up. What are we going to do? 
we're going to wake up, we're going to open our eyes, we're going to open other people's eyes, we're going to get back to the Word of God, you're not going to listen to me, but you're going to check it out from the Word of God for yourself, and we're going to see what God has to say, and we're going to be biblical, and we're going to be careful and logical and critical in our thinking, and we're going to be loving and compassionate and try to win as many people as we possibly can. Anyone else? Got a question? Yes. Um, I know a lot of Christians who have a whole lot of fun with astrology. I'm not one of them. My mother uh-huh. talks a lot about how does astrology tie in with the occult? You know, because, well, I just dabble in it. It's just fun because sure. things seem to work out that way. You're uh-huh. a Leo and therefore you're that uh-huh. way. So uh-huh. how does that tie in? Yeah. Well, first of all, we could make some basic observations that give you a one quick one sentence definition of astrology. Astrology is based upon the belief that there is a force, the Star Wars force that permeates the universe which, uh, depending upon the date and location of your birth in relation to certain heavenly bodies, will influence your destiny and determine your personality in your life, okay? So it's deterministic. It comes out of the occult. Uh, furthermore, there is a wobble on the, on the, in the axis of the earth that since the zodiac was made up has caused the earth to move one entire sign of the zodiac. So if you think you're something, you're something else, okay? It's not even it's not even right based upon astrology, and they have never rearranged the zodiac because it's not scientific. It's like a divination device. Uh, it works if you want to believe in it. And the thing that happens is, you see, I would warn you against this kind of superstition. Let's say there's a ladder in the street. You just stick up a ladder in the street and see how many people will walk under it. They'll walk around it, okay? Go into any high-rise building. Try to find the 13th floor. You don't find it. You go from 12 to 14. They're kidding themselves. Uh, they just renumbered it. But it's the 13th floor, you know. Uh, our, our society is superstitious. And any time you give uh, way to this kind of a superstition, walk around a ladder instead of walking through it, you are coming under the power of Satan. And when you just pray, I, I'm just... Sorry, when you just pretend or just for curiosity dabble in something, you are sticking your, letting Satan get his foot in the door and one thing leads to another. Uh, all you have to do is pretend and it's a very dangerous thing. Let me give them just one illustration. We have in Toronto, Canada, for example, a group called the Philip Group. This is a group of hard-nosed, materialistic, uh, uh, psychic researchers who don't believe in ghosts and so forth but they pretended to table tip, you know. They put their hands on a table and they said, well, let's make up a ghost. So they made up the name of a ghost, Philip. And that's where their name came from, the Philip group. And they said, well, let's begin, let's make up a history about Philip and let's believe in Philip. And when they talked themselves into really believing in Philip, there came noises in the table, raps, that you couldn't duplicate, coming from inside. Philip answered questions, yes and no, with one and two raps. He corrected his... Uh, history and then he began to do some things the table began to move and then the table began to levitate and float and they have it on a documentary film the table moved so swiftly around that room that these materialistic scientists had to run to keep up with this thing I could tell you of a young man who got involved in a make-believe seance he was a, a, an atheistic Jewish young man pretending to be the medium and suddenly a voice began to speak through him he became demon-possessed, obsessed with death, haunted graveyards until the demon was cast out. All you have to do is pretend. That's one of the dangers in Dungeons and Dragons. I have a stack of the manuals that high. Look up in your monster manual, devils and demons. You'll find a whole catalog of them. Horrendous creatures with the powers that they have and the spells you must cast in order to counteract their powers. Oh, we're just pretending. We're just playing. All you have to do is just dabble in astrology just laugh about it a little bit, just pretend, and you've given Satan his foot in the door. All right, another question. Mr. Hunt, what about the teachers that we have in our colleges and universities? For example, I'm taking a class on out COD, and the teacher I have is excellent in the area, which is algebra, uh-huh. but he's very much into psychology, and he keeps on talking about it. What can we do to uh, cut ourselves away from that or just turn away from that? Well, I think you could complain that you didn't sign up for algebra in order to be given psychology. 
Uh, that would be a legitimate complaint, <clears throat> but it gets a whole lot worse than that. Uh, I spoke at a, a philosophy, to a philosophy class recently at a university, and the professor there is traveling every weekend he can get free. He's traveling all over the country to follow a, a medium through whom an ancient uh, ascended master, a Hindu, speaks with a male voice and tells them how to run their investments and how to run their lives and so forth. I mean, you've got professors who are really into the, heavily into the old cult. I don't want to frighten anyone. Let's talk about demons for a oh. minute, okay? <laughs> uh, since you're on that, uh, I honestly <laughs> feel like the average church has just kind of written it off as the exorcist or some movie, but mm -hmm. we're talking a genuine experience. Satan can actually possess through uh, demons people and uh, control their lives, huh? Yeah, I, you know, that's one thing that I should say. I appreciate that because we don't want anyone to be frightened. Unless you don't know Jesus. It doesn't hurt to exactly. be frightened a little bit. But if you know Jesus, there's no reason to be frightened. This is not for that purpose. Or, or to get you obsessed and go on and, you know, become intrigued and titillated. And now, No, don't get involved in this sort of thing unless the Lord leads you specifically to do it for a specific purpose as he has me. Uh, but I'm just here to inform you a bit but you needn't be afraid he hasn't given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind and we have authority in the name of Jesus and the power of the blood of his cross to cast out demons and we need not be afraid you're tuned in with the underground Christian network